Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you probably know, I'm Nick Reed, Dean of the College of Leonard and Science. Uh, very delighted to have one of my distinguished predecessors, Dr. John Judel, right here. Good afternoon. In any case, I want to say a little bit about uh, the Capriva Endowment. Um, Paul Capriva was uh, graduated from MSU in 1957 with a degree in microbiology. He had a strong interest in the biomedical sciences for all of his life. In the early 90s, he created the endowment in our college that funds the Capriva Seminar Series um, with the theme of interdisciplinary research in the biomedical sciences, which allows us to present lectures and seminars from some of our stellar faculty in that area, such as Dr. Seth Walk, and also to bring in uh, distinguished guests from outside the university. Later, uh, Mr. Capriva also set up a second endowment that funds graduate students in the biomedical sciences and enables them to complete their dissertations. Um, we uh, are very grateful to the Capriva family for the continuing support this series and of our graduate students, and uh, Phil Caprina's legacy lives on through these gifts. Uh, one brief announcement, we have a Caprina Distinguished Lecture again <coughs> on the 25th of March at the Museum of the Rockies, 5.30. That is Dr. Gary Stoner, a distinguished alumnus of the university, who will be talking about his work on cancer chemo prevention and uh, berries. And uh, that should be an excellent event. Uh, I encourage you uh, to attend. Uh, also, we have a reception following this lecture in the Lay Lounge. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Mark Judela, department head of the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, who will introduce our speaker. Mark. <laughs> real pleasure of mine to uh, introduce Seth today. Um, if any of you saw my introduction on uh, Monday for Mark Young, I wanted to make sure this time I didn't outdress the, uh, the speaker <laughs> like I did on, on Monday. Um, for those of you that don't know Seth, I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, he got his bachelor's degree at Penn State in 1999. Um, he then transitioned, and that was in biology, he then transitioned into a master's program, finished up in 2001 at Penn State in ecology, and then took that skill set to Michigan State University, uh, where he did his PhD work, and that's where he really, I believe, acquired the skill set of working on the ecology, microbial ecology. And he then moved uh, actually to a, a postdoc at UMass for a short time, and then ended up in the medical school, University of Michigan. Um, did a three-year postdoc uh, there and then transitioned into a research track uh, faculty position. And it was roughly, that was about 2011. That's about the time um, he, we became aware of Seth. He applied to a faculty position in the Department of Micro at the time. And we recruited him uh, to MSU and he started his appointment in 2012. Um, uh, here at MSU. Uh, Seth's research area is one of the hottest areas in, in science, and it's the study of the ecology, microbial ecology uh, of disease, both of, of humans and also of, of animals. Uh, in a very short period of time, he's got an impressive CV. He's already published 35 papers uh, in outstanding journals, and in fact, there's one paper in particular that's really, really impressive, and it makes me jealous, and it actually should make uh, my father jealous. He is a co-author on a first author paper of my son, uh, who did his master's work in Ron June's lab in engineering. And not only just because it was my son who was the first author, I thought uh, this is a perfect illustration of what Seth brought to MSU, and this is uh, a skill set and a highly collaborative approach to science. And Seth has already established collaborations with people in engineering, uh, other departments in letters and science, and also departments, uh, uh, faculty members in the College of Ag. Um, he's, he received a K award, NIH K award, before he came here. Uh, 
And since being here as co-PI with Carl Yeoman in the Department of Animal Science on a NIH R21, and then last year, if anybody saw the, the, the web pages, the university web pages, uh, Seth and Blake uh, in our department got a Gates Award um, last year. He's invited to speak in multiple places around the country as an impressive uh, list of uh, uh, speaking engagements, meeting presentations, and with that I'm going to turn it over to Seth and have you uh, listen to what he's been doing in recent years. Thanks. Well, thank you all for coming today. Um, I really enjoy talking about my, uh, the research in my lab. Um, obviously, as a PI, you don't do any of the research, so I'll get to the acknowledgments at the end, but just keep in mind that um, what you're about to see today, as far as the data we generate, um, is due to my lab members, and I'm really grateful for that. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak. I'm grateful for uh, Montana State for giving me the resources and, and everything I needed to uh, launch. So today's talk is going to be about our bodies and a, a real paradigm shift in the way we think about our health and disease. And I'm going to split it into uh, two different parts. Uh, the first part will be about some vocabulary, uh, about general facts of the microbiome, and about some problems that um, are sort of showing themselves in both the literature and in the media. And so as a public presentation, this is a perfect venue to address those things head on as, as scientists and uh, critical thinkers. So our bodies are really um, surrounded both inside and out with epithelial surfaces. And these surfaces help protect us from the outside world, from opportunistic pathogens, but they also help house and give us some incredible um, partners in our life. And so, for example, uh, the skin that we all see um, surrounding each one of our bodies is about 2.9 meters squared. And these are just surface areas that are generated um, with different morphometric techniques. Actually, there's a, there's a pretty neat um, calculator online you can go to and calculate your own uh, surface area. Um, some surface areas, obviously, are larger than others. Um, so feel free to explore um, the potential of your own bodies there at that website. Uh, but some interesting things to point out. Our skin, which we all sort of consider our real barrier to the outside world, makes up a very small percentage of the epithelial surface of our bodies. And in fact, the lung, fully expanded in most of us, um, is the largest surface area in our body. And you can see that the numbers there, about 45, compared to 2.9 in your skin. Now, the GI tract has, has historically gained most of the press, most of the media, as being this very um, large surface area. But you can see that it is um, indeed smaller than, uh, say, the lung. So we see only about 3 to 4 percent of our bodies. And beauty is only skin deep. So that should. Uh, these are the jokes, so yes. else, okay. All right, I can see this is going to be a long lecture. <clears throat> so our total surface area then, you spread all of these epithelial surfaces out, is about the size of a, um, a small apartment. I think my wife and I's first apartment we shared was about 750 square feet, give or take. Um, so as I said before, the, just the GI tract alone was thought to be about the size of an infield of a baseball field. You see that often uh, cited in the literature. People talk about that. Or the playing surface of a tennis uh, court. But we've now reevaluated these, and it turns out that all of our epithelial surfaces combined is about the size of a badminton court. If you don't know what that looks like, which I didn't, I had to Google it. But um, this should give you some perspective of um, people and court. So there you go. All right, so that epithelial surface really sets the scene for microbial colonization. And the human microbiome has really um, been discovered or rediscovered, in a sense, um, recently based on different technologies that we have now to, to look at it. So what do we mean by the human microbiome? Um, it's good to start with a definition. 
This is uh, the definition used um, at the release of the Human Microbiome Project. It's a quote from uh, Letterberg, uh, Joshua Letterberg, a Nobel laureate. Uh, it says, the ecological community of commensals, symbiotic, and pathogenic microorganisms that literally share our body space. And if you don't know, Letterberg was an extremely intelligent individual, a, a, a pioneering scientist in our field. And this is by no means to take away from this idea that we need to think more in an ecological context about our human bodies. But any ecologist that looks at this definition um, would have some serious problems. And the first being the idea of a community being composed of components like commensal, symbiotic, and pathogenic types of organisms. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's just take commensal um, as the first um, part of that definition. This word is used almost ex like entirely in the literature and almost entirely used incorrectly. And just as an example, um, the top two uh, here are titles of papers. The bottom two come directly from quotes and papers. Um, one of these, I'm not going to say which, comes from one of the top scientists in the microbiome field and in one of the top journals that you could possibly publish in. So in all of these instances, um, the commensal, the word commensal, follows some function in the host. This commensal has a role in this or provides protection, prevents, does something. And just to point out that once these things start to take off, they're really hard to stop. Um, a quote comes to mind that uh, when everybody starts talking and using the wrong thing, it really goes crazy. Um, so what, what, how do we correct these terms and, and why should we correct these terms? And I think it's important to point out that if we take an ecological view of the microbiome, the, the definition of that microbiome needs to be ecologically um, stated. So the human body is an ecosystem um, and it scales in the biologic ranks that we're familiar with with ecology. So this ecosystem is composed of communities. Those communities are composed of populations of eukaryotic or bacterial and archaeal cells. Those populations are composed of resident and transient individuals and their viruses, all of whom are symbiotic. Okay, so symbiosis was in that original definition. So what is symbiosis? Literally, that just means living together, okay? So symbiosis then, in turn, uh, refers to the relationships that people want to get to in their research. And you can see that um, by these little symbols, zero means there's absolutely no impact on one of the members in the symbiosis relationship. And then the other refers to um, what the benefit is of the other partner, okay? So in commensalism, one of the partners doesn't, is oblivious to the, to the presence of the other one, whereas that second partner gets a benefit. So just by housing microbes, they get a benefit. Just by being kept at 37 degrees, plus or minus a very small margin, they receive a benefit. So if they give a benefit back, by definition, they're no longer commensal. And in fact, they're mutualists. And you can replace the word commensal very easily with mutualists in all of these contexts, um, except for this one where they try to draw a difference between commensal and symbiosis. Okay, so that's the first common uh, error as far as the microbiome, and it's very pervasive in the literature. So the second one uh, happens to be right here, microflora. Anybody want to take a stab at what that literally means? Small flowers. Okay, so where did that come from? You see this all over the place, especially in journals that don't traditionally publish ecology. And it turns out this phrase or this term came from Linnaeus. The, Linna the Linnaean classification system breaks all of biodiversity basically into two different groups, plants and animals. And everything else along the way helped that evolutionary process to see what we see today. So it's, this is the two kingdom system. It was developed in the mid to late 1700s. And this is just a quote from uh, this guy named Whitaker who improved upon this system. He said that the original system groups of, in the original system, groups of organisms which are aquatic or fungal or microscopic 
or more than one of these, were added around the, nu the nuclear concept of plant and animal derived from higher land organisms. Okay, so the whole world was focused on the way that humans perceive plants and animals or things that we could smell and touch and see. So down at the root, you see bacteria. And the reason they're called small flowers is because they were thought to give rise to present day plants. Um, since then, Whitaker in uh, 1969 proposed instead of the two kingdom system, we went to the five. So Linnaeus's system was around for 191 years. It was uh, then expanded, but still there are some long branches here that come from things that we would consider bacteria archaea that give rise to plants. So this microflora term still uh, was in the literature. And it wasn't really until 1990 where Carl Woese um, proposed the three uh, domain system based on sequencing of ribosomal RNA that we see that bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes form very different uh, phylogenetic lineages. And just for reference, 14 and 16 represent plants and animals. Okay, so these data were based on uh, quantitative measures or phylogenetic relationships in genes that were shared among all of these individuals. The five kingdom system, the two kingdom system, were based on things that we perceived as humans. And so these perceptions get perpetuated in the literature. And now in the microbiome era, where we understand a little bit more about how things, uh, the re evolutionary relationships, terms like microflora um, need to be revisited with other terms like microbiome. So communication is the most important thing that we do as scientists. So to communicate accurately, um, symbiosis means living together. It does not define a relationship. If a commensal provides benefit, it's actually a mutualist, and microbiome is the preferred term because now we understand much more about the biodiversity of life. And so we're learning. It's only 1990 since we've had this uh, Carl Woesian view of biodiversity. And so it's gonna take a little bit of time, but I would say that it's worth getting it right because one of the um, problems is when you have popular science is that the media tries to interpret that science. And so this is just one example a colleague sent my way from the Boston Globe. There's this fact, and it's even in the announcement for this um, talk that I'm giving today, that you're composed of 10 cells, 10 microbial cells for every one cell in your human body. You see that quote everywhere, and you can almost not give a microbiome talk without giving that quote somewhere in your talk. So this Globe article um, was published um, because there was a person in, um, uh, it's an NIH re researcher, Joshua uh, Rosner, and he published this uh, op-ed piece in a magazine called Microbe, which is an American Society of Microbiology um, release. But anyway, in this, they were revisiting these numbers, 10 to 1, and really the historical um, the historical citations, so where, where are these numbers coming from, which sources, and this person read it, sent some emails, talked to some people, and, and really told mass amounts of people that microbiologists and immunologists and microbiome researchers really don't know about this fact. And if you read this article, it is a, a bit off-putting. So I thought maybe um, as a thought exercise, we'd just review some of these numbers and see how far off base that we are. So in Rosner's uh, publication, he cites um, th this number for the number of microbial cells in the human gut. Um, typically, you see 10 to the 14, and typically you see uh, about 10 to the 13 cells in a human body. And it turns out this quote uh, was traced back uh, to the original citation for the number of human cells in the human body. And it came from a very profound man, um, Dobjansky, the Theolodius, Dobjansky, the um, founder of the modern synthesis of, of uh, molecular biology. And the only problem with this quote is that Dobjansky didn't provide a citation in the original text. And so Rosner, in following um, uh, Peter Smith, thought that that fact or the scientific um, 
evidence for that was lacking. Now, it was probably an oversight, and uh, Dobjansky had other intentions with that statement, but because the citation was originally missing, now we have interpretation. You know, it's open to public interpretation. So, I went back and revisited some of these things, and it turns out with uh, some updated literature based on very, um, I don't know, very seemingly plausible uh, models and explanations for body cell surface area, volumes, and things, they came up with an updated calculation, and it, it turns out Dobjansky was right on the money. Um, 3.27 was the, is the updated estimate for the number of cells in the human body, and that matches just well. So the second was the quote about uh, the number of cells in uh, microbial cells, and it turns out that this article that was cited by Rosner, who was calling out the lack of citations, wasn't even in that paper. Um, the numbers in that paper were an estimation of DAPI stained cells, so we can stain microbial cells, we can stain their nuclei and then count them under a microscope. And it turns out that those numbers, that number was about two times 10 to the 11th per gram of fecal material, okay? So that gives us at least a place to start. So then we look around at how variable um, the total numbers of microbes are in human stool. This paper uh, looked at 12 individuals, and that variation was less than, it was around a half an order of magnitude. So it does vary, but we're still within the 10 to the 11th number. And then how much uh, feces is in a human? Okay, so 23 healthy humans followed um, pass about 100 to 200 grams of feces per event or per, per day. So multiplying this out, we get about 10 of, the 12, 10 of the 13th cells in an average number two, okay? So on a cellular basis, the number then of microbial cells you leave behind in the bathroom equals about the number of human cells in your body. So why don't we tell the public this? Right? Because 10 to 1 sounds a lot better, okay? But this number is not 10 to the 14th, okay? But this number only tells us what is in our gut, okay? It's an estimate of the microbiome in our GI tract. And that's just not all. We know now that there's a healthy microbiome in the human lung. And again, that surface area is huge. We know that there's a healthy microbiome in the skin in the urogenital tract, and in the nasal and sinus uh, cavities. Okay, so combining these things help increase that number back to where we originally thought it was. Oh, and by the way, I can't leave this without talking about these guys, because the most often missed member of the human microbiome are eukaryotes. These are uh, members of the uh, Demodex genus, and these are healthy, commensal, we hardly even know that they exist. Certain uh, immunocompromised people develop some symptoms because of these. Uh, in dogs and in animals, these are uh, other members of this genus cause mange. So they are pathogenic members, but the ones in humans rarely cause any kind of symptoms. And they're just completely unaccounted for in the numbers that we currently have. So as a whole, I think the 10 to, number, 10 to 1 um, is a pretty good approximation if we're going to put a single number on it. So, as we said, your body is composed, this statement, the one that I kind of put in the description for this talk, is much more palatable for public relations than um, the number two statement. So, <laughs> but this brings up a very important point, and one that Bill Hennage in uh, Nature uh, commented on and really nailed. Um, and he said his premise was that microbiome research really needs a healthy dose of skepticism. We need to use our facts and we need to state them in a way where people cannot misconstrue them. And specifically, we need to stop gaining um, press on facts that might not be uh, repeatable or generalizable across human populations. So for the rest of the talk then, when we get into some data, and I show you some science from my lab, we're gonna follow what I call the Hennage Five, or these five questions, which you can see here. Can experiments detect differences that matter? 
Does the study show causation or just correlation? What is the mechanism? How much do experiments reflect reality? Could anything else explain the results? These are questions of the scientific process that we often use, um, but have rarely been applied to date on the microbiome. So let's just review. The good, the human body is an ecosystem. We have a new way to think about our human health and disease, one that incorporates and tries to put value and statistical weight behind the other members of our body. There are, this opens up a whole new arena for clinical intervention, and this is great. Before we knew about the microbiome, if you had cancer, the most you could hope to address about that cancer is some treatment, some drug. But now if we understand a little bit more that cancer might not be genetically encoded in our cells, and it might be a, a result from certain microbes and persistent infections, now we can help people regardless of their genotype. We're not locked in to a one-way street towards a certain disease. So that's a really revolutionizing thing. The other good thing, considering the microbiome in clinical practice um, is, is having immediate and very significant effects, and I'll mention one of those in a, in a little bit. So the bad. Stop the press. It's our responsibility as scientists not to overinflate our results. The influence of clinically trained person, uh, oh, this statement is, is important as well. So for the first time, really, microbial ecologists are working with clinicians. And if you've never talked to clinicians as scientists, there's a very different language that ecologists use and clinicians use. There's a, there is a lot of uh, knowledge on both sides, but the communication between the two is, is very different. And it takes time for this vocabulary to develop and for each side to have a sense of what the other's saying. So this is actually a good thing when it becomes unified because it brings together people that think about a problem differently and could develop new and better treatments. But it is having a bit of a lag, and I think you see that in Joshua Letterberg's original uh, definition of the microbiome. And then, of course, because of the popularity, the rush to print, the rush to publish, um, there are a lot of correlations out there in the literature right now that simply might be correlations. It might be causative, but we need to uh, really get back to some of these important correlations and test them. Now, the problem is that's called Me Too science, okay? Nature's not going to publish if you are just supporting a hypothesis. The scientific method, on the other hand, is based on support for hypotheses. So to leave all of these facts out there, these factoids that you hear on NPR or the Boston Globe or any other uh, well-meaning um, periodical, it, to, the, just leaving them there and not addressing them with more data, more generalizable data, is a disservice. And so um, this is where we are. We need to re, re, readdress some of these hypotheses. Okay, so the revolutionizing. This, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, some data. Well, we're going to, I'm going to try to introduce a, a study in, in the lab um, that we have uh, pretty high hopes for. But I think we all know about some of the revolutionary, revolutionizing stories in the microbiome. Um, the fact that certain um, microbiomes seem to be uh, associated with more obese people, let's say. Or the fact of fecal microbiome transplant or uh, FMT or something like that, where you get a donor um, stool sample and you replete your microbial community and become completely healthy. So these are uh, revolutionizing things in our field. And so instead of giving you just a smorgasbord of, of these facts and fun, and fun topics, I want to talk about what I do, okay? So uh, we're going to talk about a study um, focused around the human problem of arsenicosis. And human arsenicosis is exposure to arsenic at, to at toxic levels. This has been referred to as the largest mass poisoning event in human history, yet most of us probably are unaware of it. The fact is that most of these um, events where people are exposed to high levels of arsenic are not in the US. They're in places like India, China, uh, Bangladesh. So, 
although we're not aware of them, they're very important, and they're revolutionizing the World Health Organization. There's millions and billions of dollars putting, put into um, trying to help people with this affliction. So here are just some numbers, um, some of the main countries involved. And even though um, these numbers up here are much larger, the U.S. is not um, immune. We have a significant number of individuals in our population here in the U.S. that are exposed to arsenic in their drinking water at toxic levels. Just to give you a sense of that, here's a map of the U.S. And the darker the color, the higher the level of arsenic. The darkest color here um, has uh, a arsenic content that would be considered by the World Health Organization to be above standard. Now, the U.S. has not adopted those standards yet. They're still a little bit above what the World Health Organization um, recommends. But hopefully you can see that Gallatin County is well represented in the high arsenic area, as are other parts of Montana and the Mountain West. So this is a problem not just in India, but close to home as well. And I was talking to a collaborator the other day that um, there's a lot of political stress going on right now for uh, water quality policy because if we truly want to get arsenic below um, what's considered a safe drinking water uh, guideline, we would pretty much have to remediate 80% uh, of our um, water sources here, municipal water sources, bottled water sources in the U.S. And that's just, there's a lot of kickback for that in lobbies at, in uh, Washington. So why do we care? Here's a, uh, here are data, a large cohort study done in uh, Bangladesh, uh, people in um, high exposed areas. And you can see, uh, if you're not used to looking at these numbers, these are odds ratios, or I'm sorry, hazard ratios, um, and in parentheses, the confidence interval. Anything above a one is considered to increase your risk for that certain disease, okay? So you can see that uh, over here, 10 parts, um, 10 parts per uh, billion to 49 parts per billion increases your chances above one statistically for non-accidental death, meaning that um, something other than just having an accident, you're at increased risk for, okay? And these are mortality numbers. These are the number of deaths. So arsenic is associated then with all cause mortality other than accidents, cancers, heart disease, and increases your risk for infection, especially in high exposed areas. So I already said that, I already showed you the numbers. Um, so you have 50 to 100 million people in the world exposed to non-healthy levels of arsenic, and that exposure leads to very um, large problems in the body. And this is a very, so rightly so, this is on the radar of many different NIH uh, institutes. And the rationale there is that if we can decrease this toxicity, then we can have a major impact on these diseases. It also helps fund your lab, right, if you have four different places to go to with the same project. Um, so to understand arsenic toxicity, you have to know a little bit about its biochemistry. And I'd love for Brian Botner to come up here and explain this graph the way it should be. But for this talk, we're just going to deal with um, Reduction methylation, just meaning that as arsenic goes from different valence states and becomes reduced and then methylated, its toxicity to the human body changes. And for the most part, if the arsenic is in the form of a reduced valence state, meaning a 3 instead of a 5, then it's more toxic. Okay? Is everybody with me there? Okay, so the other part that you need to understand is thiolation. And this is easy. This is when you see an S or a sulfur group, okay? When that gets added, then it's, it's more toxic than when it's not there. So the mode of action then for arsenic of all of these different varieties, these uh, pentavalent forms, the non-reduced forms, aren't very toxic to human cells. But when they become reduced to the trivalent, they enter cells and have a biologic effect. And the same is true with the thiolated versions. In fact, the thiolated versions of arsenic um, get taken up by host cells at a much higher rate than non-thiolated um, arsenicals. Okay, so these biologic effects then influence the way cells metabolize, 
um, make a living. They can um, mutate as a result of protein damage and DNA damage, and that can result in tumor genesis in the case of cancer or can result in heart disease over chronic exposure periods. So, lunch at Columbo's. I came to Montana State in uh, the summer of 2001 to actually look around for grad school. And I wanted to meet with Tim McDermott. And I got here with my, my mom and dad, we were driving up. And I can remember vividly in the morning calling Tim's office and getting his answer machine. Finally, I called like the third time and somebody else answered and said, oh no, he's down in the park. I was like, oh man, because I really wanted to talk to Tim McDermott. And I never forgot that. Um, so when I got here as a faculty member, I kind of was razzing Tim about it one day. He said, hey, let's have lunch one day and let's have lunch soon and talk about arsenic. And so I was at Columbo's talking to Tim and, and I kind of knew what he did. You know, he was an environmental microbiologist, um, well known for his work in arsenic, but I really had no idea what arsenic was all about. Anyway, Tim introduced me to uh, um, arsenic world in the environment and microbes in the environment are very potent are very, uh, they drive arsenic cycling. They can make arsenic active enzymes. They, they do these biotransformations, these redox reactions, the thiolations. So all this is going on in nature. But Tim told me that nobody's really looking at this in the microbiome. And I just thought that that was the craziest thing I'd ever heard and I couldn't wait to get back to my office and prove him wrong. But when I started looking in the literature, um, the only research that had been done on the human microbiome with respect to arsenic toxicity was done in vitro or in the lab with um, these chemostat models that were set up with human stool. So nobody was looking in vivo at these uh, issues. And so Tim and I developed a project and came up with some hypotheses. And sort of the first hypothesis was just, okay, the microbiome decreases um, a host's exposure to arsenic. And to get at this, um, I was going to take advantage of uh, disrupting the microbiome with an antibiotic. And this, was, this has been well worked out in the lab that I uh, postdoc in at University of Michigan. This just shows a paper where um, they treated a microbiome. Uh, so this is what, um, based on sequence data, it really doesn't matter what these bugs are, but hopefully you can see there's a lot of colors here and very few here or here. Okay, that's all you got to know. So when you treat a microbiome with an antibiotic, you disrupt it meaning you change the membership of that microbiome in a big way. And this Ceph uh, refers to Cephiparazone, which is a third generation cephalosporin. And cephalosporins are used very uh, commonly in the hospital. So this is what happens basically with your human microbiome. This is in a mouse, but in, your, uh, in a, the human situation, when you go to the clinic, you get an antibiotic, it changes that microbiome a lot. And not just the membership of the microbiome, but we can measure uh, quantitatively what the load is or the level of microbes. And it turns out cephaparazone drops the load or the overall number of cells in the GI tract by three orders of magnitude. Okay, so you're dumbing down the microbiome with this antibiotic. So our approach was then treat the, uh, or expose the mice, some mice, um, expose all the mice with uh, arsenic and treat some of them with this antibiotic and see if there's any differences in arsenic. Um, that gets excreted. So question one from Hennage, can experiments detect differences that matter? Well, we think so because we already know that cephaparazone is gonna knock down the microbiome. Okay, so at 100 ppm exposure to arsenate, um, this is one of the most common forms in drinking water uh, in, in exposed human populations. What we saw was a um, accumulation in the stool of arsenic in mice that did not get the antibiotic. So this is what happens normally in a mouse um, when it's exposed to arsenic. Now that same mouse pre-treated with cefaparazone for 10 days and then exposed, we can, this, this is very much detectable, it's in our detection limit, but it was very much diminished from the normal situation. So these mice aren't excreting, they're excreting far less. So the arsenic has to go somewhere so does it go into the body? And so when we look at the organs, um, the liver turns out hepatocytes are the most metabolically active sites in the body for 
uh, detoxifying arsenic. And when we look in hepatocytes, uh, sure enough, there was an increased level of arsenic in the liver of cefepirazone-treated mice. So this told us that the microbiome is involved in excreting arsenic and detoxifying it, or at least decreasing the exposure to host. Okay, so that was a, a pretty interesting finding. Question two, does this study show causation or just correlation? Well, this is simply a correlation. We changed the microbiome and it correlated with an outcome. But we can do a little bit better in our lab. We can actually look at mice that don't have a microbiome because some of my startup dollars were spent on developing a germ-free mouse facility and some of the department's money was spent on developing a germ-free mouse facility. And this has been a real boon for um, addressing these types of questions. Anyway, these mice are basically in a bubble, a sterile bubble. We have traps in here to detect anything that can grow, either in rich media or in water. Um, we take samples from the mice, from the food, from the bedding, from their water. We go overboard, really, to look for any kind of contamination. But the biggest indicator of whether something is sterile is the smell. These mice don't stink at all. They have sort of a musty smell. And when they die, they don't bloat. They just shrink up. So it's a very weird situation, right? But it's easy to detect whether there's microbes in there. Fairly easy. I don't know if Mark would agree with that. But. So what happens when you treat these mice? Well, we saw a lot more variation in our background, so in the wild type uh, untreated, or I'm sorry, the conventional mouse. We saw more variation. Um, but again, the same story panned out. In the absence of the microbiome, um, we saw less uh, arsenic in the stool. We saw a greater amount accumulated in the liver. And then in some other organs, we also saw very significant differences. So again, we repeated our original observation. So we have, again, another correlation. Now, Koch's postulates would mean, in this situation, we need to replete that germ-free with a microbiome and then test for the effect. So if you take it away, you see the difference, you put it back, and you can restore the original observation, then you can fulfill Koch's postulates. And we really haven't done this um, because the third question is, what is the mechanism? And getting at the mechanism will really drive home whether this is a correlation or causation. So what are the microbial genes or functions uh, responsible for decreasing host exposure? Um, really to get into this though, we need to consider uh, the potential uh, mechanisms. And the mechanisms for arsenic uh, detoxification is two parts. And there's a host part because our cells can metabolize arsenic and then there's this microbiome part. And we know that there's active genes in that microbiome. So how can we partition those two factors? And this is where mouse genetics comes in. There's a mouse that's um, been derived in Nebraska by our collaborators that has this gene knocked out. This is, this is um, the most active gene in our genome and in the mouse genome for um, metabolizing arsenic. You can see here that um, in the liver, after just two hours of exposure, there's massive amounts of arsenic accumulating in the liver uh, compared to the wild type. This is in, um, this is 24 hours. This is just a single pulse dose. In our system, we expose the mice to arsenic in their drinking water. So every time they take a drink, they're getting the same. In this study, it was just a, a dose study. But you can see that there's a big effect of arsenic in these knockout mice. So our hypothesis then is the same as before, just in a different mouse strain, that the microbiome matters in these mice. And so when we did this, we, we had an amazing discovery, at least I think so. Um, it turns out that these mice um, got sick and died, okay? And we repeated this now a number of times. Uh, we're getting up to the kind of numbers that we need. But at this level of exposure, about 100 ppm, our mice actually start to um, become so toxic with arsenic that they die. And this top line just shows you that the wild-type mice are perfectly fine, okay? So the microbiome not only influences host exposure, but now it, it actually causes lethality, lethality. And when we look in the literature, wild-type mice exposed to uh, 100 ppm um, do quite well, so that's known. 
but nobody's really looked at our, uh, these knockout mice at that level. It turns out they use a lower level. And so when we do that level, which is 25 ppm, we see the same uh, overall results, decreased levels in fecal samples, increased levels in the organs, and again, um, the mice die. The only difference being that at the lower level, um, the time it takes to reach about 50% um, death in the mice is longer than at 100. So now we have a dose-dependent effect of the microbiome according to arsenic. And we think this is really interesting, right? Because most studies that use mice don't note any kind of um, morbidity, any signs of sickness. People have looked at intake, food, water. They've looked at output. And there's no real differences when you expose these mice. And so the fact that the mice die without the microbiome, we think, is a pretty revolutionizing thing. So we're still driving at the mechanism, though. We don't really know what genes or functions the microbiome is doing. So to get at that, um, this system of a germ-free mouse, um, we can really leverage that and replete it with the things that we want. E. coli is a model organism. We know the genetics of it. We can manipulate that strain, that bacteria, give it genes that we think might be important. One of those genes lie on this operon, and it confers resistance, um, the bacterial resistance to arsenic. And homologs are also found in other Enterobacteriaceae, so members of the GI tract. So it turns out when we did this study, we repleted uh, germ-free mice with E. coli. And we actually got more arsenic in the organs, liver, heart, and blood. These aren't statistically significant, but you can see the trend is in all of these organs. And the cool thing is here that we had completely the wrong notion about this function. And it turns out that this, this gene reduces arsenate to arsenite. It reduces a pentavalent form to a trivalent form. And our idea is now that that function actually makes it more toxic to the host because it's those trivalent forms that are more toxic. So we have a lot further to go here, and I have a lot more to learn about um, arsenic metabolism. But there's another prevailing hypothesis, one that Tim McDermott has, has shown in, in environmental organism and in al algae, is that uh, these certain organisms under the, certain microbes under uh, given conditions can accumulate arsenic in their membranes. And what's shown here is the accumulation of arsenic in lipids. So it could be that the microbiome is incorporating arsenic into its lipids and just simply excreting it out the other end, thus changing the overall in input into the host. So this is another um, mechanism that we need to address. But we haven't worked it out yet, okay? So we still need to address this. We have a, a list of genes that we're interested in from environmental organisms. Okay, so how much do experiments reflect reality? And these other two go kind of quick, so don't worry. Um, there's a high degree of inter individual variability in arsenicosis in humans. Um, so we figured maybe the microbiome can help explain some of that variability. We know that arsenic exposed um, microbiome changes. This was a study by another group at MIT, just came out last year that showed that certain um, bacterial families, and they're just numbered down here, it really doesn't matter what they are, some are basically killed or um, impacted negatively by arsenic exposure, other ones take off. Okay, so the micro microbiome changes, and so their functions change in response to arsenic. So we figured that this is happening in the human population. We've identified, um, Tim has a collaborator in the Hentao Basin of China, which is one of the highest impacted areas of China. We have um, nine volunteers who gave us stool samples, two females, seven males. You can see their ages. Some of these individuals have a history of arsenicosis. And when I say history, I mean they've shown signs of ker keratosis, hyperpigmentation, or uh, skin cancer. Okay, so it could be that these people with symptoms and the people without symptoms, but drink from the same water source, have very different microbes that mitigate arsenic toxicity. Now, that's only half the story because we need to get these samples and do something with them. And what's shown here is what happens when you put a human microbiome in a mouse. Okay, so the donor is a human stool, and these numbers refer to the number of days 
in the mother and then her offspring. And this just shows that the microbiome sets up pretty much like it looks like in the human, in a germ-free mouse. So now we have a test tube with human stool. That test tube is not glass. It's a, little, it's a live organism. And now we have it in, in the right conditions in a controlled environment that we can address some of these hypotheses. OK, so question five, could anything else explain the results? And this is where you know hand-waving comes in. Because we're, we've tried to set up this system to address a specific hypothesis. And the only other things that we could probably come up with to explain this inter-individual variability might be some past medical history event that's not accounted for in our data or some host genetic factor that we haven't accounted for. But we've tried to limit those possibilities to a reasonable set. So in summary, ecology is great. It's fun. but not if you can't speak ecologically, OK? You need to know, we need to know what we're talking about to effectively communicate our science. There are a lot of amazing facts out there, but we should all practice healthy skepticism using those five basic questions um, that we use today. In the context of the research going on in our lab, arsenic is a global epidemic. Arsenicosis is a global epi ec epidemic. And the gut microbiome may provide some protection against this toxicity. And we're still working on the mechanism. And this inter-individual variability in arsenicosis may be partially explained by the differences that we see in the microbiome. If we can capitalize on those organisms, capitalize on the ones that give a, us a mutualistic response, then we have a new therapeutic. And therapy with, a, with an organism like this is very, very cheap considered, considering development of a drug and all the synthesis and production that needs to go on there. So, with that, I'd like to acknowledge people in my lab. Thanks for coming today, guys. Um, Tim McDermott has been an amazing collaborator and very, um, very, a very able mentor. Um, people in his lab have, have really helped us um, technically with some of um, our hurdles. The staff in the ARC, uh, we couldn't have generated the germ-free colony without their, their support. And then I have multiple collaborators around campus and uh, um, really around the country and with Ping Lee on board, now starting to go international. So um, I hope you learned something today. I hope this was uh, fun. Thanks for coming. Thanks for, for listening. And thanks to Montana State. This, this research was not funded by Bill and Melinda Gates or, or NIH. This was funded from my startup and could not have been done you know, without support from the university. So thank you.